So this is the third in the little video series of my lectures um, and this one's going to be on things that are essentially coloured and um, the different mechanisms by which they have colour. So if I just start out with these uh, molecules here, I'll bring these along to a lecture so you can, can see them but I'll also photograph them and share them. The first one of these is called methylene blue. We can see it's um, entirely organic, heteroaromatic. Um, my second one is permanganate. This has um, quite an unusual type of bonding in it. I have this, what we like to think of normally as ionic, but is actually far more covalent. And then finally, I have just a simple um, copper solution. And what you'll find is when you get um, particularly transmission metals going into solution, they end up with an organized field of, of solvent around them or an organized field of other um, ions or molecules around them that we call ligands. And so here the copper is hexahydrate. All of these are colored. Methylene blue, as the name would indicate, is blue. Uh, you should all know permanganate is a deep purple color and copper sulfate is a pale blue color. But the intensity of these cover colors varies massively the solutions I'll show you are all exactly the same concentration but are very very different in the strength of their colors. Essentially all of this color though derives from the fact that there is a transition within the molecule where I can excite an electron from the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital, to the LUMO, the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Molecules that have high absorptions have high molar extinction coefficients and this is because the transitions are very allowed. There are a number of selection rules associated with um, all transitions but the most important one is not a selection rule but is actually a statement on the structure of the ground in the excited state. The methylene blue has a very high extinction coefficient because the structure of the ground and the excited state are very, very similar. We can see that it's not really easy to change the structure of this molecule, particularly the um, double bonded section, which is the root cause of the colour that we can see. So the transitions within these molecules are simply to do with the fact that I move an electron from one orbital to the next and as I do so I notice that the color that I see the wavelength of light that is observed differs depending upon um, the number of conjugated bonds within the molecule so here I've just got a few examples of um, molecules with just a simple single double bond pattern conjugation pattern and I'm looking at the energy gap between the pi and the pi star orbital. So the, the pi orbital is the, the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital. The antibonding pi star is the lowest unoccupied orbital. And the color, the absorption, is to do with that transition. And we can see that as I increase the number of uh, double single bond pairs, the amount of conjugation, I um, increase the wavelength. And we've already learned that wavelength and energy are inversely proportional. So as I increase the amount of conjugation, I decrease the energy gap. The more conjugation there is, the smaller the energy gap between the molecules. In these cases, all of the absorptions here are in the UV. The bottom sample with the absorption of 353 probably appears a pale yellow color, but the rest will certainly appear colorless. But that doesn't mean there is no absorption going on. It just means that our eye can't see it. If I take a slightly more complicated molecule, here I've got a carbonyl, I can see that I have two transitions. I have non-bonding electrons from the lone pairs on the oxygen or on my heteroatom and I have uh, pi orbitals as well coming from the double bonds. These two transitions have two different energies and so I see two distinct peaks within my spectrum. The end to the pi star always has the longer wavelength because it always has the lower energy. But again, as I increase my conjugation, I increase um, the wavelength I absorb at or I decrease the energy gap involved. So, this is methylene blue spectra, 
I've already said that um, it has a very high molar extinction coefficient and if I look on my y-axis here I can see just how high it is over 70,000 um, per molar per centimeter now to put that in perspective when you do the experiment in the foundation labs using the beer Lambert law the molar extinction coefficient around there is only about 2,000 per molar per centimeter we can see the absorption of methylene blue look is very much in the red end of the spectra the absorption maximum is around what about 660 670 nanometers there is a very strong absorption of red light and above it I've mapped the visible part of the spectrum that we can see so I at blue we have our uh, sorry at 400 nanometers we have our violet light 700 we have our red light and we can see that the absorption of this matches the absorption of my red light the solution therefore looks blue because it's the blue light that is transmitted through the solution you can also see that I have a small amount of absorption in the UV um, this is actually not going from a homo to a lumo but is going to a higher up energy level and is quite normal in a lot of samples so just to put some values of these extinction coefficients on different things um, small molecules DNA it's quite small it doesn't have a huge amount of conjugation has relatively small extinction coefficients methylene blue so much larger much higher amount of conjugation and more importantly the structure of the excited and the ground states are going to be very similar and they have very high extinction coefficients now in the case here of um, my bottom three examples, my potassium permanganate, my copper sulfate solution, which as I've already said will form this hexa aqua um, ligand, set, set of ligands around my iron in solution, or copper complex as we should call them, and then at the bottom I've got this procedinium chloride. And we can see in those cases my extinction coefficients are lower. The copper um, has a very low extinction coefficient and the praecidinium an extremely low extinction coefficient um, the, and it's because we have selection rules so I essentially have selection rules that say transitions can't happen between the same type of orbital shell and in copper I have a transition which is going within the set of d orbitals this is going to be forbidden by my selection rules my praecidinium this the transitions go within the f orbitals again forbidden within my selection rules so these have very low um, extinction coefficients my manganese my permanganate solution um, instead doesn't have transitions between its d orbitals if I think about the oxidation state of the manganese here it's plus seven there are no d electrons instead I have what's called a ligand to metal charge transfer in this case an oxygen is donating an electron from its shell into the manganese and as it does so it absorbs a photon of light. This has no selection rules for it and so we see a higher extinction coefficient. You'll learn a lot more about selection rules as you go through your physical chemistry classes but ultimately they're incredibly important to understanding colour and solutions around us. So as I said just to recap that we have uh, colour here for three different reasons. Methylene blue has an allowed transition, an n to pi star. It will also have a pi to pi star, which we saw with the absorption in the UV. The structures are very similar in the ground and the excited state, and so it has a high extinction coefficient. But this is ultimately an electronic transition between different orbitals within the molecule. Permanganate has a ligand to metal charge transfer, usually um, shortened to LMCT. An electron moves from one of the oxygen p orbitals and ends up on the manganese. As it does so, it needs a little bit of light to absorb to help it do this. And so um, that's where the absorption in permanganate comes from. Finally, my copper complex um, has these forbidden DD transitions. Um, and I'll explain those a little bit more later on. You should all have seen um, energy levels splitting when we have hydrogen. Um, all of the s orbitals are the same energy so s and p are the same energy um, for the two three and four um, orbitals it's only when we put more than one electron in that we start to split these energy levels now a similar thing happens with the d orbitals in that I have uh, a net benefit to splitting the levels and that splitting is all to do with the fact that we form a complex these complex or these uh, transition metals 
with an organized kind of shell around them of, of other molecules um, have d orbitals which split into two or potentially even three levels. In the case of copper, I have what I would call an octahedral field, or I have six things all going out at right angles to each other. Um, this will give me a particular type of splitting where I end up with three of the d orbitals lower in energy and two of them higher. But the overall energy, everything adds up to the same. So there's been no loss or gain of energy at all. It's just that it starts to favor me when I only have a certain number of electrons going in um, that I end up with a lower energy state. Here I show an example with titanium and I can see if I have this hexa aqua com complex of titanium 2 plus, titanium just has one electron in its D set because I remove my electrons from the s orbitals first and I see that it, it has um, put it according to Hund's rule in the lowest energy level. Now if I pass 500 nanometer light through this titanium solution then I will promote that electron into the higher orbital set, into this EG set. This however is a spin forbidden transition because essentially I have the electron moving between two d orbitals and this isn't going to be allowed so the extinction coefficient for this is quite low, just 6.1 per mole per centimetre. We take colour for granted all around us. Um, we live a very colourful life nowadays, but once upon a time life wasn't quite so colourful. And the whole basis for the strength of the chemical industry in the UK is largely due to one man, William Henry Perkin. Perkin realised that he could synthesise a bright coloured dye. He called that dye movine. And essentially he invented chemistry as an industrial process. This synthetic dye movine was bright and it was a colour that had previously only been available to the most rich of people. The absorption spectra of movine you can see here has a strong absorption around 550 nanometers, the yellow and green part of the spectrum, and it's letting through both the blue and the violet and the red light, and we see it as a pinky purple colour. Movine actually when we look at it nowadays isn't quite so simple as a single molecule. In fact it is a mixture of four aniline dyes, all very similar, all with just small differences between them. However this doesn't make Perkin's accomplishment any less great. We can see with these dyes that there is a large amount of con conjugation, lots of single bond, double bond patterns, and we can also see that there are heteroatoms as well, giving me that n to pi star transition or helping my absorption appear in the visible part of the spectrum. Prior to Perkin, dyes were extracted from natural substances. They were labor intensive, they were not often very bright colors, and Usually the intensity of them wasn't very high either. You can make natural dyes from everything, from beetroot to um, onions, that's the word I'm searching for. Um, some were made from very exotic things like Tyrian purple, which was made from the uh, mucus of a certain uh, family of mollusks. Others were from ground up beetles or ground up insects. Often they had come to the UK from all around the world. They were expensive and they were difficult to obtain and more importantly their colours weren't often very intense. Movine was amazing though in that it was stable in sunlight, it, once it was dyed onto the fabric it didn't um, disappear and it was a very very simple synthesis, it didn't involve any complicated extractions or any complicated processes in order to um, take the dye out of the molecule. This molecule here is called Ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide, as we can see, is planar. It's got lots of conjugation. I have some heteroatoms in there as well. It's got everything going for it to have a good, strong absorption, which it does. However, Ethidium bromide is a really good example that it's not just the molecule that gives me the wavelength of absorption or the color of a solution and the wavelength it absorbs. Ethidium bromide shows what we, a, a property that we call sulfatochromism. 
Sulfatochromism basically says that the colour depends upon the solvent. In the lecture, I will show you an example of ethidium bromide in a range of different solvents, from water through to methanol, ethanol, propanol, butanol, and pentanol, and we can see the colour changes throughout. The reason for this is that the different polarities of solvent are offering a different environment for my molecule, which I can see, whilst it has a single charge, it's largely um, non-polar. By stabilising the molecule differently, it means I have a different energy gap between each of the different forms. A different energy gap means it's absorbing different wavelengths of light. So here's another example of um, colour. Everybody's seen a peacock feather and I expect you've all marvelled at them. Blue is quite rare in nature and iridescence is even rarer. Peacock feathers are actually remarkable because they are an example of what we were going to call structural colour. In my first lecture I said that Robert Hooke had been fascinated with pigments and dyes and he had looked at peacock feathers initially and found that they are actually brown. The pigment, pigment in peacock feathers is brown and if you look for, at them from behind that's the colour that you'll see. There's nothing clever going on the front in terms of pigment. The colours actually come from something far more remarkable and the colour of peacock feathers is exactly the same cause as the colour of things like butterfly wings as well. As, I, as I've already said this is called structural colour. The reason being here is that I have light going into my sample and it meets many and very different layers. The thickness of these, thickness of these layers will depend upon um, the colour that I observe. The thicker the layers, the longer wavelengths of light are going to be interfered with. So my light goes in and it reflects off every layer in turn. I end up with the same constructive and destructive interference pattern that I see when I look at young slits. And therefore, some colours don't show, others do. This blue and green basis is based on the fact that blue and green are going to interfere constructively, whereas red is going to interfere destructively. This simple, basic idea has actually been used in nature a lot. I can see examples here of a butterfly wing and look at the structural colour within it. The top is top left is the most um, large scale picture here and each one in turn is zooming in and zooming in and zooming in till I end up at the bottom right hand picture and we can see the amazing fine structural detail within the butterfly wing. This detail is formed by chitin, the same thing that forms most shells of animals. Um, and this chitin has pockets of air between it. Iridescence is caused by very, very slight differences in the thicknesses of these layers, and that's why the angle can often have an effect on the colour that we observe. It's an absolutely remarkable trick of nature, but is also something that uh, we have been trying to replicate in more modern years. Another example where um, microscopic detail gives the colour is in the gemstone of opal. Essentially, this is just a very simple form of silicon dioxide, the same thing as we have with sand, but there is water in, mixed in there as well. What happens is opal is just a precipitated layer of tiny nano-sized silicon dioxide balls and these arrange into sheets and layers. These sheets and layers pack in different ways, sometimes more efficiently than others, and they layer one on top of the other. As they form these layers, they end up with a structural colour for exactly the same reason that uh, butterfly wings do. But more importantly, we can start to see why opals so often look like many and very different um, kind of colours all layered onto each other, because it depends upon the packing of these spheres. The size of the spheres, the size of the gaps, the order of the packing, all affect the colour of opals, and they are a rare and beautiful gemstone. This Opal slide introduces me to gemstones nicely. The same silicon dioxide that I saw before in a different crystal form um, gives me quartz, and quartz can have many different colours. So 
we're all very well aware of amethyst being a, a purple color, but the main body of the structure of quartz, um, which is colorless, or we can potentially see it as white, um, an amethyst is the same thing. It's just some impurities that make the difference. Rose quartz, a pink, smoky quartz, brown and citrine and a yellow colour are all essentially the same rock. It's only the impurities which give things colour. So in citrine it's a small amount of iron. The pink of rose quartz is usually given by manganese but also occasionally by titanium. I can also end up with um, free silicon forming smoky quartz and sometimes when I see smoky quartz, I can actually see strands of free silicon in there. Gemstones are incredibly beautiful and especially beautiful when you understand that it is just one atom in a thousand being different, which gives them all different colors. I'll talk a little bit more about, um, about colors and the effect on gemstones in the actual in-class sessions but essentially we can think about this in the same way that we had with our semiconductor materials where I dope things just replace one or two atoms with one or two atoms of a different type so it's not just quartz that displays this color corundrum which is the general form of rubies and sapphires is actually naturally transparent but by including impurities, iron, titanium, chromium, copper, and magnesium, I get all of my different colors of my gemstones. It wasn't understood initially that rubies were essentially the same as sapphire. It was only when we started to understand more about the properties and the optics of these gems that we actually realized that they were the same thing. If I look at rubies, um, essentially, my aluminium oxide, my Al203, is colourless. If I replace just a small amount of that, a tiny five in a thousand atoms of aluminium with some chromium, I end up with a beautiful ruby red, the best ruby you've ever seen. But as I increase this too much, the stone becomes dull and grey. Eventually, chromium oxide, or Cr, 203 is a dull green pigment. Nothing particularly gemstony or novel about it at all. So it's these small changes which make a gem from ordinary to extraordinary. So we can see here our whole periodic table. I can start to mess around with things if I start to change the number of electrons that I have in a system but it's more easy for me to just swap out a um, swap out an atom or a molecule that has the same number of valence electrons. So for example, swapping aluminium here, which is just below boron in group, um, I'd go call it 13 or three, depending on how you think about things, with um, chromium in its three plus oxidation state. So here I've said that we have Al203 is the basis of corundrum, I start to swap that with um, my chromium and I see the beautiful ruby red. If instead I replace some of them with an Fe2+, and some of them with a Ti4+, I end up with the most beautiful cornflower blue sapphires. Overall my charges are all balanced and so my system is stable. So now I've discussed colour from absorption of small molecules and I've discussed colour from um, solid state samples where I swap out individual ions. I've also mentioned structural colour, but I can have another type of uh, absorption and colour and that is colour from nanoparticles. The Romans used to synthesise the, the most beautiful red glass and they did it actually by making nanoparticles of gold and including it in their glass. Now, of all my examples of colour I've given today, this is actually the most complicated to explain, but it's ultimately due to something that's called me scattering. Me scattering just means that the light of um, certain wavelengths is scattered differently by different sized samples. As something starts to behave more like a macro scale thing, um, me scattering is no longer the dominant form of colour. 
nanoparticles are incredibly interesting for various reasons. Um, not only do some of them display interesting properties upon absorption, but others display interesting properties of emission of light. This is a modern phenomenon. But colloids and nanoparticles have a benefit not just from their colour. Silver nanoparticles have been used as antibacterial agents for at least the last 20 years and um, Dr Jenkins actually uses silver nanoparticles in his research to treat burns. I hope again that I've just introduced to you some of the complexity of colour within a molecule. Um, we'll discuss some of these examples for, in more depth in class but again, just you know, to understand how beautiful the world is around you and to not take things like colour for granted, I hope is the basis of some of this course. Thank you for listening.